Welcome to the Maxillofacial and Ocular Emergencies module of this series. Now, for those of you who have been watching some of the other lectures, you'll know I already shared that my, my career began in otorhinolaryngology ICU. So I, I started my career as an ENT ICU nurse. And I think I've always had a really special place in my heart for this topic, for your maxillofacial and ocular uh, emergency stuff. I know full well when I work in the emergency department, People like my specialty because I'm the guy that doesn't mind taking care of the ugly eye injuries and I'll do all the trachs. I mean, that's just stuff that, that I always did. So this is kind of an area that's near and dear to my heart. And perhaps one of the complaints I have is that they only uh, set aside 11 questions from this area. If it were up to me, all 150 questions would be maxillofacial and ocular. But I'll bet you I'm glad that the BCN doesn't listen to me and they didn't make it 150 questions. But instead, as I said, about 11 questions, not about, but exactly 11 questions or 7% of the exam will be involving injuries or emergencies to the maxillofacial and ocular area. So as always, we're going to start with a challenge question. Here we go. A patient presents with intense eye pain and redness in the left eye. The emergency nurse shines light in the patient's right eye. If the patient has iritis, what response is expected? Let me read that question again, because that one takes a little bit of thinking. A patient presents with intense eye pain and redness in the left eye. The emergency nurse shines light in the patient's right eye. If the patient has iritis, what response is expected? A, nystagmus in the left eye. B, increased pain in the left eye. C, lack of pupillary response in the right eye, or D, visualization of bright flashes of light in both eyes. All right, good luck on that one. Let's start by talking about the cranial nerves. Now, you know, a lot of times I'm asked, do I really need to learn the cranial nerves for the test? And, and the answer is, of course, no. I mean, you don't have to learn anything. If you get a question on it, you might get it wrong, but let's face it, there's a lot of, um, a lot of material in the cranial nerves, um, you know, to memorize and you might or probably won't get a question. So you have to decide if this is worth your time. Perhaps some of you already have them memorized and that'll be to your advantage. But if you do want to learn the cranial nerves, I've provided with you with a couple mnemonics that I hope will help you. So right now there's a chart on the screen which is also found in the handout that provides these mnemonics to you. But let me just quickly um, uh, go over the mnemonics with you. So the first mnemonic, uh, oh, once one takes the anatomy final, a good vacation seems heavenly. That mnemonic it just helps you memorize the, the names of the 12 cranial nerves. Obviously, the first letter of the mnemonic equals the first letter of the nerve, and you can see that in the table. So, you know, that's, that's a mnemonic you can use if you want to memorize the, the names of the nerves. Probably more helpful is the mnemonic on the far right-hand side of the screen. Some say merry money, but my brother says big brains matter more. By the way, that's the family-friendly version of that. But anyway, um, that one helps you learn what the nerves do or their function, how to assess them. If the word starts with S like some, it's a sensory nerve. If the word starts with M like Mary, it's a motor nerve. And if the word starts with B like brother, it has both motor and sensory on it. And so you'll look, for example, you know, cranial nerve one is the olfactory nerve. The word is S like some, so it's a sensory nerve, and this one allows you to smell, which is a sense, right? Cranial nerve three is the oculomotor nerve. It's involved with pu uh, pupil reactivity. It starts with an M for motor because that's a motor nerve, and pupil, pupil reactivity is motor. Uh, cranial nerve seven is the facial nerve, which is the word B, uh, or it was brother with, the, with B for both. And of course, this one allows both motor and sensory because it allows you uh, to move your face um, uh, um, as well as um, to, uh, uh, to, to um, be able to taste as well. So those are some of the things that occur. So you have both motor and sensory on that one. All right. You know what? Let's move this past this chart. What I do want to focus on more than the chart itself is I really want to focus on the uh, cranial nerve disorders. So let's go down to cranial nerve 5, which is the fifth cranial nerve, uh, the trigeminal nerve. And this one is one of those both nerves, right? So this one allows you to um, feel your face or give sensation to um, at least half the face, um, as well as um, the, the, uh, this one allows you uh, to chew. 
So the facial sensation would be the sensation part and then the chewing would be the motor part, right? So that's cranial nerve five. Now a disorder of cranial nerve five, the trigeminal nerve, is known as trigeminal neuralgia or tic de la rue is the common man's name. So you may see either, although I would guess on the exam they'll use trigeminal neuralgia since that's the medical name for it. Now people with trigeminal neuralgia have a um, disorder of that, that cranial nerve that causes a neuropathic pain along the distribution of the nerve. Now, neuropathic pains are described as electrical shock-like sensation or sharp stabbing pains, and they'll tend to shoot down the, f the side of the face along the distribution of the nerve. If you're watching on video, I've got a picture there on the uh, left-hand side of the screen that shows the three different branches of the nerve and where the pain may occur. So the patient may have pain in the forehead, pain in the cheek, or pain in the jaw, or they could have the whole distribution involved in pain along that entire side of the face. But the pain can be quite severe, and it can, it can, can cause a loss of the ability to do activities of daily living, um, and you know the patient can be quite debilitated. Um, now, the pain is often precipitated by activities that kind of irritate the nerve or bump the nerve. Things like brushing your teeth, putting on makeup, chewing, those kind of things can cause that pain on the side of the face. Uh, this, uh, this is a neuropathic pain. Now, neuropathic pain is pain that arises from the nerve itself. It's not a stimulation of a pain receptor, but it's a disorder of the nerve. And there's lots of examples of neuropathic pain, like phantom pain after an amputation, um, cancer pain, you know, uh, patients who get pain from like radiation burns or whatever. Um, and it's not, it's not that the pain receptors are being stimulated, it's the nerve itself that has the disorder. So when the nerve is irritated and you get that neuropathic pain, that electrical shock-like pain, actually neuropathic pain does not respond well to standard analgesia. You know, we would normally want to give morphine or NSAIDs for pain, but neuropathic pain, pain of the nerve, doesn't usually respond very well to that traditional analgesia. So the treatment for neuropathic pain is adjuvant analgesia. Now what is that you say? Well adjuvant analgesics are, are drugs that have analgesic or membrane stabilizing properties but that's not their primary purpose. And the three main classifications of drugs that are adjuvant are antidysrhythmics, antieleptics, and uh, antidepressants. Now, when I say antidepressants or I say anti-seizure medication, I doubt you immediately think, oh, pain medication. But actually, those are effective pain medication for neuropathic pains. Um, they'll they'll, they'll um, stabilize the membrane of the nerve and that reduces the pain. So yes, for, for pain like trigeminal neuralgia or phantom pain or whatever, those are the types of drugs we use. Um, you know, Tegretol, Dilantin, the, the types of things you'd use either for seizures or, or, or antidepressants as well. You know, if I use a, a personal story, uh, my younger brother lost his legs in, in a, a gunshot uh, battle in, in Iraq when he was serving over there uh, in the military. And he has horrible phantom pain, even to this day. You know, when we're talking 15 years later, his, his phantom pain is unbearable. Um, what, what's interesting is, um, you know, he, he uses anti-seizure medications to manage his pain. It doesn't work the best, but it's the thing that works the best of anything. You know, certainly trying to use narcotics or NSAIDs did nothing for him. But <clears throat> Dilantin, Tegretol, Depakote, those types of things do give him some relief. And, you know, so he's just a good example of the use of an adjuvant analgesic. And again, the three main um, drugs that fit adjuvant analgesia are antidepressants, antieleptics, and some antidysrhythmics. And they're mainly going to be used for neuropathic pains, pains that arise from a nerve. <music>